This evening, we're going to separate ourselves from Europe. European philosophy start, started with <clears throat> knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. That's the difference. Our real spiritual ancestors, the Greeks, had a different vision. Knowledge must include an ideal, and that ideal must benefit man. And that's the difference between the moderns and the Hellenic world. Nearly all of European thought explores this idea that knowledge is power. Therefore, I'm going to introduce you to an idea, the idea of art as a knowledge that presupposes an ideal, <clears throat> and that ideal in every case must benefit man. Now, every time I use the word art, it's best if you ignore all modern references to art and take it in a new way. The Greek word is techne. Now, we're now going to understand the idea of art in an entirely Greek Hellenic way, and that's where we're going. So, let's start. First, I want to talk about different systems and the people who represent them. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about medicine, the physician, piling a ship or a plane, a bank robber has a certain degree of knowledge, it's a knowledge system, a merchant must have a knowledge, a dentist and a coach. As we go through this, you should be able to see why some of these must be excluded, must be excluded, and why some must obviously be included. <coughs> because there are two I didn't put here, and that's going to be the evening's discussion. All right, so there are two missing. We should see whether or not we can get them in there. So again, what are we doing? We're going to look at knowledge as a particularly interesting system, a system that presupposes an ideal, and that ideal benefits man. All right, we're looking at these different systems, and therefore what we need is a model. That model, therefore, we're going to then apply to all of these, and we're going to look for the missing two. Now, as you know, my superior art gives me a chance to show off my artistry. And here, you see, now everything I say about this figure should equally be applied to all of these, up to a certain point, and then there's going to be a difference, and that difference is going to be art. So. I went just one minute. Surely. Can you go back to the first? Uh, oh, surely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The Platonic idea of art as knowledge. And it's a special kind of idea of art. It's the idea of art as a knowledge that includes within it necessarily an ideal, and that knowledge and ideal must benefit man. That's a totally different idea of knowledge that we're used to. We come from a European culture, and the basic idea of all European culture, European modern Christian culture, is that knowledge is power. It comes from, as you know, Bacon, who started the game going, and Descartes and these people. Knowledge is power. If you have power, you can use it. If you have use it, whether it benefits man or not is not the issue. That is Europe. We're going back to the Greeks, and I hope into the modern world, because I'd like to see this old idea revived and brought forward, because I think that's the only thing that's going to be able to save man. Fair enough? These are the systems, and these are the people who represent members of that system. And here you see a beautiful picture of a man. And uh, 
Uh, this, he's wearing a hat because certainly we can say he has the knowledge. Along comes someone. Now remember, I'm going to use the example of the physician, but in turn, you should be able to apply it to the pilot of a ship, pilot of a plane, bank robber, etc., all the way down. Now, along comes someone, and you can see in this terrible picture that they are in pain and suffering. Now, what does knowledge allow this man to do that others do not have? It allows him to see through his knowledge and understand what he sees, and that advantage allows him to do something which you can only do if you have this kind of knowledge. That is, you can understand what you see. And therefore, if you have a certain kind of knowledge that you can understand why this person is the predicament and the predicament that he's in and the situation that he's in, you can then translate your opinion of his status and give a diagnosis, right? That is, through your knowledge, a gnosis, through a dia, right? Through your knowledge, you then can give an assessment of this man's condition. You can say, I know what's wrong with your condition. One, two, three, four, five. That's a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. On the basis of the diagnosis, then, he can then give a treatment plan. And on the basis of that treatment plan, he can start a process going to reverse the condition. But he must also have a follow-up a follow-up plan to make sure that the kinds of changes that he's introducing in fact occur in the way in which they should. <clears throat> now, if the subject, this person, he's only a person at this point, believes that this person with the knowledge can in fact make this kind of a diagnosis and give this kind of a treatment plan follow-up, he then has to risk something, has to risk. There's always a risk in this kind of knowing. Have to risk that maybe he is correct. Maybe he's right about his diagnosis. The person never knows as much as the person with the knowledge, and therefore he has to believe that, in fact, they have the knowledge they claim to have. Faith, belief. Faith is something else. They have to have some belief. Now, if that person now goes the next step and says, I think that I can engage you, at that moment, he must voluntarily, it must be voluntarily, he voluntarily enters into a relationship. It must be voluntarily. And when he does that, he changes his status He's no longer a person, he becomes a patient, and he gets a new name. And when he enters into this relationship, this person no longer merely has knowledge, but he now is your physician. Actually now, notice, these are fancy words to disguise some truth, and I'd like to introduce the truth. What he really becomes is a subject. And when he enters into this relationship voluntarily, he is really his ruler. He is really a ruler. And as a result of that, because of his knowledge and because this person entered into the relationship voluntarily, he then has the right to command the subject and order that subject to follow a certain course of behavior. He has the right to say, take this medicine, do this kind of thing. That's his, that is his right. It's his right because of the knowledge. Because of that then, he now becomes in the full sense a ruler. Now. 
in the course of the treatment plan, this subject may endure and go through even greater pain and suffering than they had before accepting that physician as their physician and treatment master. So they may go through more pain, endure greater hardships, <clears throat> change their way of life, their relationships, and the whole question of course is, why would anyone want to do that? Take the easiest case of all, the dentist. Would you not agree that the dentist, we have all suffered under a dentist, and would you not agree you go through greater pain with the dentist than you would at any other time? Why, why are we so foolish then to endure more pain, experience greater hardships, change our way of life? Why do we go through all of this? Are we not then becoming masochists and allowing this person in charge yeah. to produce such pain upon us? What's, there's only one reason. What's the reason? Well. And then in that sense, to avoid a greater pain, one big word, benefit. A perfect example of this is the movie King George. Mm -hmm. He went to the doctor and the doctor took over his complete life. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the only reason we're willing to go through this? Benefit. benefit. Let's try one more thing. If the subject if our subject, who changes it, right, he changed his name from merely being an individual person, he becomes a patient because he enters into this relationship voluntarily, because he has a certain belief. The belief is that by entering into this relationship, even though he may go through greater distress than he had before, he's doing it because he thinks in the long run he may benefit, and that may in fact change the, what might be inevitable worse conditions if he didn't do so. Now look here. Suppose our subject, the patient, discovers that all of the remedies, everything the physician is asking him to do, benefits him rather than the subject. Suppose he discovers that the drugs and the treatment plan and everything that he does brings about a greater benefit to the physician. What does he have a right to do? Relationship and bring him into court yeah. for malpractice. Therefore, in this relationship, any time there's a suspicion that the person with the knowledge, the person with the knowledge, is making their decisions to benefit themselves rather than the subject, we call that malpractice, don't we? Right. And we have a right to bring them into court. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me, now I'm going to go one more step. This is somewhat heretical, of course, but here it is. The person with, what we are now going to call this, an, an art. The person who has the art then, has the knowledge. With that knowledge, he's able to make a diagnosis, a treatment plan, a follow-up. He then will only accept those people who voluntarily enter into a relationship with him. The person who enters into it must have a belief. That belief must be that they have the knowledge and they're going to use their knowledge to get the benefit that the primary benefit goes to them only. Now, I'd like to introduce two more ideas now. Here we go. Would you agree there can be two? They, there can be a set of twins. Twin doctors, exactly alike in all the grades they've ever received. They do everything exactly alike. There's only one difference. And one will make one pre a preeminently successful physician in the way in which we're talking about, and the other a failure. It all depends on just one word. Now, legal. One is legal. <laughs> they're both legal. Okay, they're both, both legal. legal. Okay. Um, Let's try it. They can get the same grades. Yeah. If they have, he must have one thing different. One thing different. And that is... You have to have ability to give confidence. Uh, no, not even confidence. See whether this is true or not. 
to the degree that he has a very clear perception, a very clear idea of what is health. The, he must have an ideal of what health is. An unmistakable ideal of healthiness, say healthy, healthiness, the quality of health. The one who has the sharper idea of that, intuitive idea, because you can't teach it, to that degree would you agree that the person is able to see the difference between the conditions of his patient much more sharply because would you agree a diagnosis is nothing other than taking the ideal and subtracting the condition of the patient, that subtraction is the diagnosis. That is the diagnosis, isn't it? The sharper the person has the ideal of health, of healthiness, the quicker and the more efficient and with greater acuity they can make a diagnosis, make sure the treatment plan works, and the patient benefits. Would you go further and say, this whole art of medicine, therefore, is nothing other than the person with the knowledge is trying to bring the patient closer to, closer to that ideal. That's the whole goal to the degree that the patient is able, to the degree that the diagnosis and treatment plans follow that, it is successful. One more step now. Remember I said two. Would you agree that this physician, who is far more successful than his brother, may in fact be poorer? Matter of fact, he could even work for free. And that would in no way detract from his ability to be a great physician. Because the success that a person has financially is a result of mastering something independent of an art. And that is the skill. It's a skill. It's not an art. And we're going to go into this in a moment, in a minute. It's the skill of how to enter into, the skill to enter into and to manage contracts. That ability, the skill to enter into and manage contracts and how to collect fees and how to establish all kinds of money matters is separate always from any particular art a person may master. Right. Notice we're not calling this an art. Right. Now let's see if we can now apply this to what we said and let's see if we can do it and bring it together. Now. Remember we said we're going to use the model of the physician and then jump through each of these categories and apply it success sec successively to each. A pilot of a ship. Would you agree? If a pilot is a pilot, he must have a knowledge. Yes. If he has a knowledge, he must then be able to order and command people to do as he tells them to do. But they have to enter into that agreement voluntarily. They have to believe that he has the requisite knowledge to make the kinds of decisions on the high seas because they're running a risk since they don't have that knowledge. Would you not agree the captain, the pilot of the ship as it were, pilot in the sense of the, the captain, he must make and he's responsible for making sure the ship or the plane is in proper condition to take off or to take the voyage. He must make a diagnosis therefore of the vehicle as well as the crew, the passengers and the supplies. He therefore must set forward a treatment plan, that is to say how to manage the condition of his ship and his crew towards some goal, and he must continuously monitor it, follow up. Why does he do that? Everything he does, would you not agree, must be for the benefit of the voyage itself. What would happen if he would run his ship the way a merchant is allowed to run his store? As an example, a merchant has some knowledge, let's do it. Merchant has a knowledge, obviously. Right? When he makes his decisions, is it to benefit the subject? No. Well, it could be, yeah. If the merchant were to run, if a local store, a merchant, was to run a store the way a physician runs his business, would you agree as people came in, he would treat them as patients and say, excuse me, you bought too much sugar last week and I want to make sure that, oh, six packs of beer, excuse me, you had your limit two weeks ago and you cannot go over it, right? 
uh, your condition isn't as good as it should be. I suggest before you come in and get these things that you want to buy, you run around the box several times and get in condition. <laughs> Therefore, we don't enter into a voluntary agreement with the, with the merchant, do we? No. no. And we don't want him to act as a person with an art. We'll take the burden of our decisions, won't we? That's right. Now look here. The dentist, does it fit the dentist? Dentist must have an ideal, right? Etc. Does all this fit? How about a bank robber? He has the knowledge. He makes a diagnosis of the condition of the bank. He must understand where the safe is. He has a certain plan. He wants to get away, a follow up. Where does it fail? Benefit. Benefit. And? That's right. That ideal cannot be used as a measure to benefit the subject. The subject is a victim. Uh, oh, you're getting, oh, that's one of the two I was going to go for. <laughs> Would you agree the coach is in the same thing? A good coach must have a very clear perception of what an athlete is, what a sport is, and on the basis of that make all the decisions? Now, you see, here's the real problem of history and social life. There are two, remember we said there are two people in here, and one of them you guessed at. One is the Roshi, the teacher. Some Roshis are very successful because That's right. they don't let them have easy answers. That's right. That's right. So, so one of the issues is, in this class of arts, in this class of arts, do we dare put in two people? All right? Now I'll use the classic name, the philosopher. Because the philosopher in the old days is the guru of today. All right? because they too pursue wisdom. Their highest goal is the achievement of that wisdom. That wisdom obviously is of a transcendent nature, uh, transcendent that is to everyday experience, and therefore it functions in a similar way. Now let's follow this, but before we do it, let me make a bridge to another idea. The other person is going to be, and of course this is the 20th century or maybe the basic problem of man. Would you agree all of these titles, the physician, the pilot, the dentist, the coach, they get their titles from the particular kind of knowledge they possess. Yes. But in reality, they're really nothing other than rulers. And the people who voluntarily enter into them are really subjects. Mm -hmm. But because it's a special kind of knowledge, we give them these titles. And when a physician, by the way, no longer benefits uh, the, the patients, but only benefits himself, and the law gets after him. What do we do? We can't take away his knowledge. We can't take away his practice. We take away his title. You can't call yourself a this or a that. Can't call yourself a physician. I've never heard of that happening in this country. Can't, can't, can't call yourself a physician. No. Oh, no, you can't call yourself a physician. No, no. They, can, they, can, they, they can't practice. Can't practice, can't call yourself, you can't offer yourself to the public as a physician. Well, they, 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 lots of times they still keep practicing, just go to another city. Well, okay, then they're acting, though, <laughs> illegally. Yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, ready for the next one, then? Okay. Most important. And this is the whole subject of, uh, of great debates. Can political science be an art? Can governing man be an art? Because if so, let's do it together. Therefore, people must enter into the state voluntarily. They must have a belief that the ruler will bring about a benefit. And they must therefore risk it because they don't know whether the person has the knowledge. Does it fit so far? Let's see. Now, if Pete Wilson were to run for office, we would ask him, would you not agree the following questions? Peter, where is your diagnosis? <laughs> I think he had a wrong position. <laughs> <laughs> but would you not agree, if it is like an art, we should ask for a diagnosis? Yeah. All right? Then we'd ask him for his treatment plan. Yeah. We would ask him for the follow-up and whether or not he has the skill to follow it up. And one other most important thing that runs through all of this, and I wanted to introduce it now, okay? I wanted to introduce it about the. It must have a curious feature to it. This is it. Whole. 
every one of these people who has an art must approach it holistically. Yeah. If you met a physician who only could work on the right hand mm -hmm. or the left thumb or the right leg, would you not agree he might be able to repair all kinds of things going with a part, mm -hmm. but we would worry about whether the particular treatment plan that he's following, whether it has an effect on the other parts of the body. Therefore, our necessary conclusion is, for all of these, that the, each of these people who has an art, they must treat the whole and understand that the part relates to the whole. Therefore, we would ask Pete Wilson, would we not? Sir, would you please tell us the different divisions and parts in your society? Yeah. Identify all the segments of your society for us and we'd see that all the segments are represented. Then we'd say, sir, would you please give us a diagnosis of the strengths and the weaknesses of each of these parts? Hmm, now that you've done that, certainly you want to bring them up to, the, to a, a level where the subjects benefit. Oh, sir, would you tell us then how the strengths of one can complement the weaknesses of the other so that the whole can reach a higher level of functioning? Because we want to make sure that not one particular segment of society is benefited. We want to see that the whole is benefited. Say the same for Gingrich, too. Yeah, oh yes. <laughs> now, if that's true, then our ruler must have a very clear idea, an ideal of a just society. Therefore, the ideal here must be of a just society. Now, the idea of justice, that's a strange word, just. <clears throat> the English word fair is better. Because we don't, the word justice takes on legalistic forms. Uh, the Greek idea of justice is much closer to what we want here. And that is, <clears throat> the idea of justice is that each part is doing its proper role and is functioning properly, both in respect to itself and how it can contribute its role to the whole. Well, the medical doctors, they, they specialize in some areas, so it might be good for the heart, but it might be lousy for the kidneys. But we wouldn't want him on our staff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'd say, you're approaching it like a skill. You see, you can, people who approach their knowledge as a skill are not interested in benefiting the whole. They may only want to benefit a part yeah. and for themselves. Yeah, uh, well, that's right, that's what we do, right? So therefore, look here, what do you think will be the implications of this on our system, on any political system? Well, we agree, we have an ideal society. But the argument against it is that there is, you cannot identify the knowledge which when applied will benefit man. If we can show there is such a knowledge that can benefit man, and man therefore is made better as a consequence, then that knowledge exists. If there is an ideal then that can be pointed to and justified, that is to say if there's justification for the idea itself, then we have a system we can then introduce. Therefore, you see, if there is any place where anyone is acting against the benefit of the particular society of which he is a member, we will say, sir, you are like a, why, you're like someone who's practicing medicine without any concern for your subjects. That's malpractice. We can say, sir, though you have the knowledge of a captain and you know ships and you know crew, you're acting like a pirate. We'll give him a new name. We'll call him a tyrant. And if we had any international law, we would say, sir, you're an outlaw and we would send whatever we need to take over that state and replace him with someone who has this vision. Now, this comes from two works, Plato's Ion and Plato's Republic. Now, we're going to now push into this level. All right, here we go. <clears throat> now, this is a curious field. Now, we're going to make a little jump here, you see? We're going to go from our model because now we have something else. The condition for our model now that we put in the ruler and the philosopher we now need to introduce a new idea. Would you agree 
The only reason these arts are needed, only reason these arts are needed, is because man is not a self-repairing mechanism. If man was a self-repairing mechanism, we wouldn't need medicine, would we? If man had the necessary vision, we wouldn't need a pilot of a ship, we would all have the knowledge. Therefore, would you not agree the existence of these arts presuppose two things. One, that there is such a thing as a pervasive ignorance, which we're not afraid of, that's not something terrible, and we appreciate it when we find someone who has the kind of knowledge and will give them the right to function with an art and give them all kinds of titles so long as we are sure that when they use that knowledge based upon some ideal, lofty ideal it must be, that it can bring about our intrinsic benefit. That's essential. Therefore, this only works and the need for it is because of the existence of ignorance. Now look here, I'm going to take away everything we said. Oh, all but one. None of these people possess an art. Now, okay, none of these people possess an art. Because now we want to raise the level of our discussion one more step and let's see how we can do it. I have a particular person in mind. Let's see if we can play. Is it possible that you may be in a situation where you have to make a judgment about whether or not you should help someone or not? Let me give the, the case a point. If you were a physician and you had the vision of this particular patient, here he is. And you're the physician, or you're serving in any of these capacities. Do you think it would be a good idea to restore him to health? If you could do it 10 years before he enacted the concentration camps and the death. If this is Joe Stalin or any fascist today who destroys his people, do you think you might wonder whether or not you should go ahead and benefit him or her? Yeah. Let me go another way now. Take the same question in another way. I'm going to take one word and push it whole. Suppose we went to a physician and he said, oh, I can diagnose your condition. I know exactly what's wrong with you. I can give you a treatment plan and a follow-up, but I have a particular question. I don't know whether it's going to do you any good to be better. After all, I really want to benefit you. Now, how will I know when I restore you to health that it will be to your benefit? And he'd sit back and he'd say, it's time for a new kind of consultation. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to treat you unless I know that you are, as a result of my work, you are now going to turn around and benefit others if I'm going to benefit you. Yeah. Oh, let me do it another way. Suppose the person is too weak to have an operation. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of times right. they operate on the person who's too yeah. weak and they die. Yeah. The only person who benefited was a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me ask you another one. What are the things that truly benefit man? All right, let's say medicine. Does that truly benefit him, or does that bring him just from... Now, I'm going to use a model now. Here's the model I'm going to use. Maybe I can use a clean piece of paper. Here we go. No. Alas, alas, for a clean board. Here I have a line, and here I have medicine. And a patient comes in, and therefore he is ill. 
needs treatment. Does the physician bring him to a condition of full healthiness or does he bring him and then is willing to discharge him when he's no longer ill? Is the task of the physician to bring him not just to non-illness, must he go beyond that and bring him to true full healthiness? Or is that the task of a gymnast? Or a body trainer? Or a physical therapist? What can a physical therapist do? Does he take someone who is not ill and brings them up to a level of maximum healthiness, depending upon the condition that they started with. Therefore, this art benefits only to some degree. Another art has to pick him up and bring him to full physical functioning. Suppose we did that with this subject. We brought him, he was ill, bring him to a physician, physician cures him, the physician then sends him to a physical trainer, and the physical trainer says, now that you've done this, you know what? You've got a lot of emotional problems. I mean, you're now physically well, you're no longer diseased, you built up your body, I think it's necessary to send you to someone else. Is it likely that we might be able to send him to some psychotherapist or someone skilled in that field? And then we could then again, would you agree if this fits, that person could still be regarded as ill? Is it their job to bring them to no longer non-illness? Is there a place for something else over here then? This deals with the body. This dimension deals with the body. This dimension, curiously enough, deals with the soul, or the psyche, or the mind. If so, does that require something else over here? Yes. Look here, is it possible that a psychotherapist could say, look, I have treated you, thank you very much, you've gone through my treatment program, I followed every step along the way. You indeed have benefited. I've given you this new test, uh, all kinds of projective tests, the MMP, the MMPI, et cetera, et cetera. You no longer are suffering from any illusions. Is that maximum development, like the maximum development that a physical therapist can bring you to? Or do you have to do something else to maximize that side? If so, if you go with this reasoning then, then there's a need for some other category here that can then take someone who is ill physically, they're brought to physical well-being, they can then be judged necessary to do some additional work to bring their psyche up so they no longer are distressed by all kinds of mental conflicts and emotional disorders. They're brought to a state of non-illness, but now they have to develop their full potential within the mind itself. Well, it happens in Brooklyn. <laughs> this is the classic image of the philosopher in Plato. This is the role of the Socratic philosopher. Or, as you mentioned before, the guru or spiritual leader. Because he can't deal with someone who is ill physically, he, the person has to be in sufficiently good health, robust health, to endure whatever is going on. They can't have all kinds of mental conflicts about what's going on and project all over the place. So therefore, it presupposes, does it not, for full functioning, that the person has gone through this and now can approach that field. If so, that brings us back to the curious problem we had before. And that is, if there is such a thing as philosophy, and if it can benefit man, using philosophy again in the Greek sense, not the modern sense, then we can look at this entire process in a new way. And that's where we're going. All right? Okay. Now, notice what we're on. We have to look at this in terms of, is there some kind of, same language as before, a knowledge, a knowledge then that can assess, can diagnose, can offer a treatment, 
can offer up a follow-up. That presupposes, therefore, that the person must voluntarily enter into the relationship and must be based upon a belief that that person does have the requisite knowledge. There is a personal risk a person must go through. That presupposes that the person who is taking on the risk is ignorant of something that may benefit him. They have to have the acceptance that that person has that knowledge, but most importantly, that everything that that person does is for their true benefit. And a person must be guided by the highest ideals, otherwise it's not going to function in that way. Has to have a highest ideal. Now, what is that ideal? What's that ideal? Because now we can say our philosopher must fit all of that and the ideal the person must have is the ideal of the highest excellence. Highest excellence. Noblest excellence. And the kind of excellence which when man reaches allows him to benefit in the most important way, holistically. Now, the interesting word, you see, when you're talking about the highest excellence and the noblest excellence, that is the definition of an interesting Greek word, which is aretheia, or what we sometimes curiously translate as virtue. Now very few people use this word anymore, virtue. Therefore, like, the, like uh, other words, they've lost their original root metaphor, as they call it. We should replace it with what it means, which is a highest kind of noblest excellence, or moral excellence, or, or pure vision. That's virtue. Because that's what the word means. In the earlier times you could talk about the virtue of a horse without being laughed at because the assumption is that there is a certain kind of excellence a horse may have and if you bring him to a good horse trainer a good horse trainer should be able to draw that excellence out if you have a good dog all right, and you want to bring out the fullest excellence of that dog you invite a dog trainer say look here this is my dog what would you suggest I do You'd have to make a diagnosis, have to set up a certain plan, try to help you deal with the dog in the most intelligible way so that you can bring out the full excellence of the dog. That could apply to a voice teacher. A yes. voice teacher is supposed to bring out the highest potential. That's right. That's right. This is the model, isn't it? Yeah. And any time anyone suspects that any of the decisions are made to benefit the practitioner rather than the subject, we would quickly say, avoid that person at all costs because they're acting in our terms unethically. So therefore, the highest ideal must be the highest and noblest sense of excellence, the kind of excellence that can benefit man most intrinsically for the fullness and the wholeness of his being. Now, that allows us to go one more step. All right, here we go. That ideal must deal with the whole, it must be a benefit, we see, and we saw a few minutes ago, how it could be applied to the political and the philosophical realm. And now we want to push it into the philosophical with our next sheet. Here's where we're going. This requires a new model. Could use more blackboards. Plato has a magnificent dialogue, the Symposium. This is a model that comes out of the Symposium I'm going to construct. It deals with the whole of which man is a part. It deals with everything we've been talking about. Let me bring it to you first. Man, you see, man is a part of this vast and strange and mysterious thing called reality. The whole of which man is a member, all right, has the nature of, uh, 
I should call it first the divine, the mortal. <coughs> Man is mortal. The God or gods are divine. That's also, therefore, the realm of the intelligible. Man deals with what we're going to call opinion, and I'll get into that in a moment. All right. Now, between these two extremes, these are extremes, there is a mean. And of course, all Greek philosophy and all Greek metaphysics has only one basic core idea. And you often see it, and when you're dealing with it, you should always look for it. And that is the mean analogy. Now, we dealt with that when we were into Proclus, Proposition 148. Remember when we dealt with that? But basically, the mean analogy is A is to B as B is to C. Another way of putting that, these are the two extremes. We can represent it algebraically as A is to AB as BA is to B. These are the extremes. These are the means. The reason this is so basic and central to Greek thought is that they have one idea which dominates their thought, and that's the idea of participation. As this approaches this and participates in it, that participated part can be understood as a main analogy. A, B. The part Participating, that's the doctrine of participation. Sometimes it's called sharing, sometimes it's called participation. Therefore, between these two extremes, there is something between the two. Love. Now, love in this sense is the, is, has one basic dynamic. Love is a desire. A desire is a lack and therefore, if there is a love for something, it presupposes there must be a lack of it. And therefore, anyone who loves has a desire for what they lack, and therefore they seek to be full, or to be replenished, or to be satisfied. And therefore, it's always a lack of something, all desires. But love is a special kind. It has a special attraction for something, and it, the thing it must always be attracted to is beauty. Would you not agree, everyone, whatever you see as beauty or beautiful, you progress towards it. You want to share in it, you want to participate in it, and the more you see it as beautiful, the more you want to get into it, participate in it. The grander the vision, the more beautiful it is. The more real it is, the more beautiful it is. They go together, real and beautiful. Now. Plato, therefore, says, look here, between these two extremes, there must be a process going both ways. From men to the gods, the gods to men. And, by the way, I'll just fill it in. Going from men to the gods, they send up petitions and sacrifices. And coming back down are commands, just as we did before. Notice the same language the commands, and the releases, to release from previous commands, releases, sometimes called requitals. Now, through this comes all the communion and conversation between man and gods and gods and man because, because, here it is, because through this intermediary passes all the arts. Through this intermediary passes all the arts. Now, he's going to use this word arts in the highest sense, and that's why we're using it. He says, first of all, they're the arts of divination. How to get in touch with the divine. All right, the art of priests and priestesses. The art of sacrifices. The art of the mysteries incantations and certain words that can be used 
as charms and charms and spells as it's called through these arts through these arts therefore there's a passage between the two and therefore all conversation and communion between men and gods and gods and men take place now we're going to use these words these are the arts and let's see what we can do with them now this is from Plato's symposium we're taking the idea of art from the ion and the Republic which is where we just went ion and the Republic Ion, by the way, is one of the shortest dialogues. It's beautiful dialogue, artistically, uh, has a great architecture and a great deal of beauty to it. It's only about 25 pages. The Republic, as you know, is the master work of Plato, the great dialogue. The thesis on art that we just went over is in the first book. So if you're interested in catching up, all you need to do is go through the Ion in the first book of the Republic and everything I'm saying you can find right there. Now. If there is a way in which man can reach the divine, if there is a way by which man can reach the divine, that to Plato, as he describes it in the Phaedo, is the mystical way. He calls himself a mystic in Plato's Phaedo. He says, I am a mystic. He says, I, I've spent all my life being one. And uh, if you're interested in the citation, it's at... Uh, 69e in the Phaedo <clears throat> and he says therefore the whole goal of the philosopher is to get in touch with the divine now the divine in the Greek world is the nature of nature of reality now we often call that ultimate reality Ultimate reality is that which is most intelligible in its very nature, right? So ultimate reality is the object. The way to reach that is through some process of divination. That is the activity, the action that brings one to the divine. What's the divine in the Platonic world? Ultimate reality. You could take a look at that. The last paragraph of Socrates' speech in the symposium clearly spells that out. Now, what is a sacrifice? Would you not agree what we've been talking about in terms of all of the arts? You have to be willing to sacrifice when you enter into a relationship with an art. You have to pay the fees, yeah. And that is, the person who has the art can command you they have a right to command you. They have a right to tell you to change your diet, change your way of life, change your job, change your location. And therefore, if they command you, you have to sacrifice correspondingly, must you not? In order to gain the benefits which are assumed to follow from the treatment plan. So therefore, if there is a way to the divine, it necessarily presupposes sacrifice on your part. Mysteries. Now, what does he mean by a mystery? What we mean by a mystery and what they mean by a mystery, of course, is the opposite. The Greeks, the Greek world, their idea of mystery is what we mean by religion. Only in the Greek world, you have to be invited into the mysteries, and in the modern world, they go out and get you evangelized, right? So it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> but in the mysteries, the sacred mysteries of the Greeks, there was said to be a dramatic disclosure of the very dynamics involved in this search for ultimate reality. Basically, people argue one way or the other, but they all agree on that one thing, is that the mysteries presented a very noble presentation with very rich images, which had a great impression on the participants who uh, were initiated into it, that had a moral transformation of their character. This is what is accepted by nearly all authorities. Therefore, the mysteries is a way to be introduced into the sacrifices as a way to gain divination. Mm -hmm. Sometimes religion is defined as a relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Now, another sense of mysteries. Now, this is quite interesting. In, in the symposium, he has actual steps, a, a kind of intellectual aesthetic yoga which he outlined step by step 
whole series of steps. And as you know, uh, Socrates' speech in the symposium, uh, which if I can reference the Rouse translation, it has only 12 paragraphs, it's, it's only 10 pages. And therefore notice I'm giving you a reading assignment that you can master with quite ease since it's very short. Of course you may have to spend a long time on the parts. But in Rouse's translation, he says that he breaks it up into 12. And if you went into it, you would see that these steps of what we're calling the intellectual yoga occupies the 10th paragraph. The 11th paragraph brings the person all the way up through these various steps to the final vision and that vision is into the very nature of ultimate reality, which is experienced as the perfection of beauty. Overwhelming, said to be the, in that experience one discovers the meaning of life, and one therefore can see how man is most benefited by that vision. Uh-oh, philosophy benefit. Why? Because at the end of his speech, he says, it is through these arts, it's in this way, that man becomes a friend of the gods and immortal if any man ever is. So therefore, up in here is also immortality. Up here is what he calls the most beautiful thing, and this is what makes philosophy so magnificent, Greek philosophy. He says, the nature of ultimate reality, when perceived by the subject, by the person, it is an overwhelming experience of beauty. Beauty, therefore, is the most, the, uh, pardon me, reality, therefore, is the most beautiful object. Being the most beautiful object, anyone who catches a glimpse of it knows what it is and does everything to try to pursue it and proceeds into that vision. Now, that means there is a method. That's a treatment plan. Hey, that's a treatment. Because the language that is used by Plato is that very language. You must be led step by step by, this, by your teacher. Because Socrates' teacher was a woman. Her name was Ma uh, Diotima of Mantinea. Diotima, as she's sometimes called. By the way, there is some discussion of whether this is a real person or not, but what's interesting is whether it's real or not, he volunteers the fact that she is uh, his teacher and he points therefore to a woman being his teacher, which I find very important. And she introduces him through these, each one of these, each one of these therefore she introduces him to the process of divination, the need for sacrifice to change your life in order to bring about a higher vision the mysteries, the way up that intellectual process, it's an intellectual aesthetic experience becoming more and more embraceive as it proceeds. It goes this way, you see. It starts with a, just pursuing beautiful bodies, a beautiful body, and creating beautiful speech and loving it. And then it progresses into more and more greater universal, it becomes more universal in scope, until in the final step it's a contemplation of the great ocean of beauty. And in contemplation of it, of course, he creates many magnificent and beautiful speeches in the abundance of philosophy. And that prepares for the great vision. That vision, therefore, that then comes and emerges, allows man to see the nature of reality is not any different in its most intrinsic sense with one's own reality. And therefore, one finds that the nature of ultimate reality is not any different than the core of one's own existence. And therefore, in that, one experiences a oneness between oneself and the nature of ultimate reality. That oneness, of course, is the goal. Because that's what ultimately benefits man. That vision of knowing that there's no difference between ultimate reality, which is beautiful, and oneself. One other thing now. He adds one more thing and he says, the thing that is most beautiful is wisdom. And wisdom is that perception of ultimate reality. 
Therefore, the ideal that the philosopher must have is wisdom. That's the ideal. As pure beauty as the nature of ultimate reality. The philosopher, therefore, must have this knowledge of how to tell whether or not a subject can take such a ride, can endure such a trip, and whether they're capable of doing it, because that's one of the bis basic questions in the symposium. Therefore, there has to be a diagnosis, a plan, approach. There has to be a very careful following up to make sure each step is vindicated, followed. It has to be entered into, belie into voluntarily. The person must believe that it's going to benefit him, and he has to take the risk. Ah, now, there's an interesting consequence to this, you see. And this is, of course, everything I've said here, by the way, is in the second paragraph. This whole model I've constructed here is, comes out of the second paragraph of Socrates' speech in the symposium. He adds one more thing, which I, I find very interesting. He says, this person, therefore, who's mastered this, has mastered these arts on two levels, both awake and asleep, master of dreams as well as the waking world. Therefore, it can function on both levels, both awake and asleep, to bring about those kinds of diagnoses and treatment plans and follow-up for the whole of man so that man can be benefited. In Plato, what does he do when, he's, when he re reaches that point? He returns back to society to help others reach the same vision. He's obliged to return back, and that's the allegory of the cave, that after seeing the nature of reality, he voluntarily returns back to the cave and becomes back among those who are still there stuck in their ignorance and tries to assist others in the same vision which he himself has, has gained. That's the goal. Therefore, it returns back to benefit not only himself, but society by participating in this. Now, let's see what we can do. Now, we've talked about Proclus, and I just want to bring in Proclus for a few minutes. Proclus looks at this, and he, of course, accepts all of this. Proclus is the 5th uh, century Platonist who looks back on all of the Platonic tradition, and he brings it together in a magnificent form. And he looks at the same model that we've outlined, and he says the basic element that takes place that makes this successful is that the sacrifice and the dedication puts to rest the inferior powers and the conflicts involved in it ah, settles for the vision. Remember our model we had here before? Yeah. He said, what does this allow? This allows the philosopher who goes through this, now his the inferior power is at rest, he can now turn towards the contemplation of, his, of the very nature of reality. But to see the nature of oneself and reality in one vision is to turn about, is to turn about and see into the nature of oneself. This turning about and seeing into one's nature is this word, essence. That's what the word really means. All right? In Greek, it's usia. Therefore, the sight of one's own essence is the sight into one's own nature, a reflective turning about to seeing into your own nature and recognizing there is a vast power there that is a part and parcel of oneself. For Proclus, he says, the thing that is most important at this stage, he has five stages, this is the third, is that through this process, man makes a great rediscovery. And he says, every man must make it. And it must be a rediscovery. We must discover once again, rediscovery, that we are part of a rational, intelligible world. Then we can cooperate with the world and we can be intelligible as part of an intelligible reality and bring about the betterment of ourselves and mankind. By doing that, it brings it together by saying, we must reclaim 
we must reclaim, claim once again, we must reclaim that from which we departed, yet in which we still reside. For in this Platonic vision, of course, coming into existence, becoming encased in a body, that descent, that's a descent into the body, that the soul into the body, right, is a return. It must be a return. It's a return. We went into the body, and that allows us, watch now, it allows us to do something which is very important. We need the arts. We need all the arts. Because when we're in the body, we have to navigate. We have to look for our own benefit. We have to now control ourselves. We have to chart our voyage. We have to become captains of our own soul. We have to gain all of these arts. We must gain all of these arts, turn them on ourselves, because we have become ensouled, and no one can do it for us. We have to turn around and return from the source from which we came. Because for him, what's important is that we really didn't depart wholly. There's a part of us that still resides in the divine and through these kinds of trips or these kinds of meditations and contemplations and yogas and intellectual developments, we can reach that. That's the goal. That's what he's trying to achieve. That's what he does. And therefore, man is in need of the arts for his own perfection. We need the cooperation of others who have that kind of knowledge that can bring us together so that we can become part of a whole. And in that wholeness, find the nature of our own existence to see how kin we are to the nature of ultimate reality and benefit by a vision of wisdom which is the most beautiful of all possible visions for man to behold. In that, we see the immortality of oneself because the nature of the intelligible is eternal. We're part and parcel of it, and therefore he concludes his, in the 11th paragraph, he says, therefore, through this process, man becomes a friend of the gods and immortal if any man ever is. That's the Greek idea of art, taking you through three dialogues and Proclus. Thank you. Is that easy to repeat? Yes. The last three uh, lines, yeah. Yes. This is Proclus now. Okay. Proclus did a very, very fine work called, matter of fact, I'm very glad you mentioned that. Uh, you see, there's a beautiful word. We don't use it too often. It's this word. <clears throat> Providence. Providence. Literally, that's Latin, of course, right? Vidi is to see, right? It's, or, or yeah, to see. This literally means to see what you see before what you see before, literally, uh, this is pronoia in Greek. Uh, pronoia, noia is nous. It's what's prior to nous. It's the energy, it is that condition which is prior to the intellect, which therefore extends itself through all reality as goodness. The arts only exist because part of the nature of reality, the nature of reality, must be good. Must be good. All the arts point to it. Every time one confirms all of this in a vision, must recognize that that ultimate reality they experience is goodness, so they've got the wrong thing. Therefore, pronoia, or providence, is that energy or power which comes from the divine, which which is a free gift, as it were, for the goodness, for the nature of goodness to emerge. Now, there are two realms. There's a realm of providence and the realm of fate. <clears throat> What is fated is everything that is connected by cause and effect. Everything that's connected by cause and effect, that's fated. 
That's in contrast to providence. Providence includes fate, right? It includes it, but goes beyond it. We can represent it in this way. Right? This is providence. Providence, therefore, is greater and reaches further than fate because providence presupposes a kind of goodness which can then descend wherever there is anything that has self-motive. Anything living that has a self-motive within it. Man, of course, has that as well as he participates in mind, intellect. Therefore, there is a providential aspect to the nature of reality which extends goodness as far as reality into all aspects of reality, all the way down to the physical universe. Right? And it brings about necessarily goodness. Therefore, the idea of art is nothing other than providence functioning through knowledge for the benefit of man. That's really what it is. So. Uh, this work comes from a work of Proclus. That work is called On Providence. Mm -hmm. And it's a very fine work, and I'd recommend it. It's difficult to get, but then they're now printing it once more. It's now, uh, all of Proclus is being reprinted. Now, all of uh, Thomas Taylor's editions are being reprinted, among which is all of Proclus. Mm -hmm. So, going back to your three lines, Therefore, for Proclus, we must reclaim that from which we departed. We must return to it. Now, <clears throat> if I could give you a model, the way in which, the, I'm going to use this model over here, over here. I think a good way to picture this is let this represent for the moment the divine the nature of ultimate reality for the moment, all right? <clears throat> uh, for the Greeks, man abides within that, but we are closed to it. Our ignorance closes us off from it. So therefore, by turning about and learning about oneself, necessarily one is participating in the divine. There isn't that gap in transcendency that sometimes takes place in different theological systems. The, the very nature, the imminent nature of man is the same as the divine. Exactly, but, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's right, that's Buddhism. Oh yes, yes, that's a very close kinship between the two. Yeah, yeah, was that helpful, did that help? Yeah. Ah, good, good, good. Yeah, Proko's very fine. Matter of fact, I brought it with me, just in case. It's an old translation. I had it Xerox long ago and, and uh, kind of <coughs> marked up a bit. <laughs> I'll read a section for you then. Uh, he's just talked about, well, let, let me give two. His sentences are quite long, so just I'll give three, three sentences. Just finishing this, pretty much he's gone over what we did in different language, so just assume that what we've said now fits with the section I'm dealing with. <clears throat> just talked about the kinds of knowledge which uh, has a purifying power on the soul. Uh, the soul is replete with images and knowing nothing, nothing subtle <clears throat> and unattended with material nah, let, me, let me get a it's a negative case I know, let me give a positive case just 
She's got such beautiful language. Okay, after both of these energies of the rational soul, let us survey her now, running back to her highest intelligence, through which she, she sees other souls in the world, which are allotted the heavens and the whole of generation according to the will of the Father, and of which she, being a part, desires the contemplation of them. But she sees above all souls intellectual essences and orders. Now, this language comes out of Plato's Phaedrus. And we should do Plato's Phaedrus because it... it uh, let me unpack that. The, uh, in Proclus, in this awakening, in this awakening, one then can recognize that same quality in others. Well, in that case then, you're awakening to the fact that the differences between men, mankind, are insignificant compared to the commonness they share with the divine. And therefore, one immediately sees, as he calls it, <clears throat> the reality of sister souls, that we are all of one family. And from that vision, then, one can then turn to the nature of the intelligible itself. That's his goal. Just take a look at the nature of the intelligible itself. When he talks about that, he says, that must be done through unification, right? Union. We become part of a union. That's a unifying process. Because he's got one more step to go after this, and that's to the nature of the one or the good itself, or the highest vision of God. Uh, the, high, the good, the good itself, they call it. The one itself. And when he talks that way, he's no longer talking about plural gods. It's the God above all gods. Uh, it's the good, the one in itself. And man's ultimate destiny is not merely to go up and down these mystical heights, but to become one with the one. So that we become subject. That's right. That's right. No differences. Right. Abolishment of all differences. And in that vision, you can say nothing which is uh, Meister Eckhart and other Dia Negativa theses. Well, the object disappears. The object disappears. <laughs> it was never there before. It was never there in the first place. <laughs> That's what the guy at Simran Zen Center used to uh, continue to talk about, the subject. God is subject, not object. No, oh, yeah, not an object, not an object. Object is different. But we always think of God as object in Christianity. Mm, that's true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can I help you with any question? On why I hope to be able to answer it for you. We didn't cover too much tonight, did we? Only a couple of thinkers. <laughs> <laughs> Just be